This hard work is essential to keeping Islanders safe and keeping Jersey in the favourable position we are all currently enjoying. We've looked at how we can protect the freedoms we've regained since April through our Safe Exit Framework, and we are planning how to avoid the type of second lockdown currently being enforced in other countries. As I've said repeatedly, another lockdown would severely damage the health of islanders and the health of our economy. It would cost lives and livelihoods. In the Council of Ministers, we've been considering a package of preventative measures to keep cases low and stop clusters forming from these cases. And it is important that we begin to roll out these measures in the autumn whilst cases are still low so that we can stop them becoming clusters. Now, I know some islanders will think this action is premature given our current low case numbers, but we've got ourselves into a favourable position by following sound medical advice, and we must continue to do so. Now, it's been a long time since you've heard me talk about a pandemic curve, and that's because we don't have one in Jersey. We flatlined it long ago. But look across the water at their graphs and how quickly their infection curves are rising, are rising together with rates of hospitalisation. And that is what we could be dealing with. And this is what we want to prevent. So that is why we're putting in the measures early. If you like, a smoke alarm fitted once the house is on fire is absolutely no use at all. So the measures that we are proposing are small changes to Islanders' daily lives, and I would ask everyone to consider them in the light of the impact of the global pandem pandemic beyond our shores. And if we can all keep working together, can support the community and the most high risk, then we will all get through this winter together. To do so, the government has dramatically increased our local testing capacity through the establishment of our dedicated on-island facility. We've enhanced our test, track and trace systems so that it will be ready for the deployment of a mobile app. And we've prepared a new public awareness campaign for flu and COVID-19 to make sure that when vaccines become available, islanders know how they can access them. Further on-island prevention measures were discussed by the Council Ministers uh, earlier this week, and we'll be making detailed announcements about these next week. But one measure, which many of, you will, many of you will already have seen reported and discussed, is the wider use of protective masks in indoor public spaces, including supermarkets, shops and the library. Now, I want to be really clear, this will not include wearing masks in workplaces. And it will sit alongside further community testing and screening of frontline staff and more targeted enforcement activity in the nighttime economy and for those who should be isolating. Now, these small steps that we believe will have a minimal uh, time and physical impact on islanders' uh, lives can have significant impacts on controlling and preventing the spread of COVID-19. Now, now, I'd like to ask the Minister for Health and Social Services, Deputy Richard Renniff, to talk about uh, the changes we will be making to our border testing regime from next Tuesday. Richard. <laughs> Thank you, Chief Minister. Uh, as you have said, Jersey is currently in a good position, one that has been achieved thanks to the ongoing cooperation of islanders. And I would like to thank everyone who has followed the guidelines and played their part to keep the rates of transmission so low in the island. Throughout the summer months, we have not seen COVID-19 transmission within our community. And we have an excellent test, track and trace programme in place to find and isolate cases should they be detected. Where guidelines have not been followed, we have intervened, and this has led to stricter enforcement and prosecutions. We will continue this approach throughout the winter to keep islanders safe, and as a reminder to those who need reminding that we have not yet reached the end of the pandemic. The actions of the few will not be allowed to ruin the freedoms of the many. Our new on-island testing centre has been operating for just over a week, reducing average turnaround time to our ambition of only 12 hours. With this new capability, we can update our regional classification thresholds to bring us in line with European Commission proposals, which sets amber levels across the continent at 50 cases per 100,000. 
Today we are releasing new regional classifications at a more granular, lower tier authority level for England. These new classifications will be in effect from Tuesday morning and will require all arrivals from green regions to undertake a test both on arrival and after five days if they are still in Jersey. Once our turnaround time for test results gets below 12 hours, we will require all arrivals from green regions to self-isolate until they receive a negative result. This is how we will maintain and enhance our border protections. A further announcement will be made in due course to confirm exactly when this will start. For regular and business travels, travellers, the option to undertake a verified PCR test before arriving in Jersey still remains, provided that a negative result is received within 72 hours before arriving in the island. Full advice, including a breakdown of regional classifications and the steps for inbound travellers, is now available on the gov.je website and via our dedicated coronavirus hotline on 445566. In the meantime, I want to emphasise that we must not be complacent as a community. Physical distancing, frequent hand washing, the use of masks where appropriate and consideration for others remains vital in our fight against COVID-19. With these steps in place, I am confident that we can protect our health services, protect vulnerable islanders and protect our community through the winter months. Thank you. The Chief Minister, Dr Muscat, and I will now take questions. OK. Thank you very much, everybody. Um, sorry, find the, find the glasses, it's always helpful. Um, should we go around in rotation? So uh, perhaps two questions each. So Channel, BBC, Bailiwick and JV. So you're talking about trying to use um, targeted restrictions rather than a full-on island-wide lockdown again. What kind of things are you considering? Are we thinking about bringing back distancing at two metres? Might we see limited mixing of households, rule of six type thing like we've seen in the UK? What's kind of on the table? So at this stage, I think actually might, that might be one for me to hand to Ivan, but the principles are the distancing side, the intention at this stage is... Uh, is to remain at the one metre uh, internally, but it's reinforcing the point that externally, we've always said, actually, the bigger distance you can have, the better. Uh, and I think that's, that's one of the clear messages that needs to go forward, but not, in the work, not inside in the workplace because we know the consequences have come through. Uh, there are various measures we've referred to already, which is around additional testing and screening going on. But perhaps, Ivan, if you want to um, cover some of the ideas we're talking about. Thank you very much, uh, Chief Minister. Um, so, uh, the um, increase in testing uh, and, and tracing and its uh, further augmentation with the introduction of an app will further help us uh, identify uh, uh, symptomatic and asymptomatic cases earlier and to uh, contact trace in relation to that so that uh, where there is just one or two cases, they remain one or two cases and don't become a cluster uh, because we've missed their, their presence. So that, that is really very important indeed. And in pursuit of that, uh, we are continuing to increase uh, our surveillance of uh, uh, essential workers. We have uh, mapped out uh, who to survey and how frequently. And many of these people uh, are at increased risk of catching COVID, and by dint of that, they're at increased risk of spreading COVID to others. So they are the highest risk people, the highest tier uh, in terms of uh, COVID. So if we're picking them up, we will be uh, hitting, if they're positive, we will be hitting, if you like, uh, uh, very accurately the, those areas we need to hit in order to reduce uh, onward transmission as efficiently as possible. Um, very importantly, we have noticed uh, that recommendations have been made, but because of the uh, lull of summer, uh, adherence to those recommendations has started to dwindle. 
uh, I think uh, increasingly people are seeing that COVID, is, uh, COVID activity is increasing all around us and are perhaps starting to uh, think that, yes, COVID has not gone away, a matter that has been emphasised repeatedly by the Chief Minister and other ministers uh, as, as we move into autumn. And uh, therefore, uh, ensuring increased adherence to the recommendations must be part of our uh, repertoire of measures to help contain COVID. The ambition being, of course, to ensure uh, that we introduce uh, our measures preemptively. It is easier to prevent something rather than to react to something and correct it. Um, masks uh, uh, in indoor public spaces uh, are part of our response. They reduce the transmission of droplets and reduce <coughs> the uh, transmission of disease from the mask wearer to other people. They also have. They also protect the source to a lesser extent, uh, and importantly, they also importantly they reduce the severity of disease. Should you get it, because the inoculum size will be reduced, giving the immune system better time to catch up with the infection. And they also uh, remind us that COVID is still here. That we're not in normal times. It is not normal for people in Europe to wear masks, wearing masks signals that, yes, we still have this threat overhanging us. Um, uh, we also need to make sure that visiting uh, in care homes and hospitals is uh, maintained in, in a disciplined fashion so that infections are not brought into these um, high uh, super spreader sites. Uh, we need to make sure that there is more support for individuals who are shielding. Uh, we need to support them even more than we supported them this last winter because they are now entering a second round, if you like, of, of shielding. Um, and uh, we also need to look at uh, those activities that we currently undertake that may result in significant spread and see how we can uh, put a, uh, put, manage those better. And just on the care homes then, what is the threshold for stopping visiting in care homes again? You must have a sort of a, a figure or a, a state yes. of play in mind. Indeed. So uh, the, the guidelines which have agreed, been agreed with the uh, Jersey Care Commission uh, earlier on this, this year uh, remain at two named individuals uh, per, per resident. Um, the uh, what we are seeking, and we want to maintain that, that means that the number of new individuals coming into a care home is limited. Uh, what we are looking at uh, is uh, perhaps increasing the duration of time that each visitor can spend with that individual to compensate for the reduction in the number of visitors that an individual can, can, can see. But you don't envisage stopping visiting altogether like we had to do over the winter, over the, sorry, the spring? Uh, at the moment, uh, the, the, the plan is to limit the number of visitors so that we don't return to that position of having to stop visiting. If COVID activity escalates significantly, then we will have to consider, seriously consider, stopping visiting to care homes to protect uh, the residents in that care home. Care, like any institution, uh, uh, care homes are a super spreading site, but of course the uh, people within the care home have a huge vulnerability because of age and underlying disease, so doing our very best to protect them uh, is, is, is really very important indeed. And just quickly for the Chief Minister again, um, when you talk about um, sort of in targeted enforcement in the nighttime economy, is that going to be around uh, physical distancing, people from different households, contact tracing for establishments? What I think is that just like? as a starting point, and we've aired this, I think we aired it in, certainly in August, and I can remember doing it on the hot seat somewhere since then. Um, uh, the, for example, uh, hopefully everybody knows that when you go to, for example, a, a cafe or a restaurant, they, a lot of them have got their QR codes down and you give your details and all that type of, uh, 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 all that sort of area. Not everybody is still do, is doing that yet. So it's, it's around, basically, we're going to be wrapping up the sort of words of advice as the starting point to so say you've really got to be doing this. Uh, it will be, um, I think we're becoming aware that within certain pubs and things like that, uh, which should still be a, a seated service, uh, we're not seeing that. 
So again, there needs to be, this needs to be starting to be ramped up. Now, if we can get people to comply with those basic measures, we don't have to take, at this stage, further measures. But that's one of those balances we've got to keep looking at and keep seeing how we, uh, what we need to do. If people are responsible and remember that we're not back to normal, then, uh, then that actually limits the further number of measures we've got to do. So it's all in the hands of individuals at the end of the day. But essentially, step one, let's get, we're increasing the enforcement and we're going to be starting to uh, advise uh, establishments that they do need to be enforcing that compliance with the existing rules. So will these be new criminal offences? People will actually be... At, at this stage, it's words of advice and saying. Now, uh, after that, I think it depends within the measures that, the, uh, that already exist and whether they, then the minister needs to bring further powers in. Because obviously, we've, uh, at the moment, done a combination, uh, it was a long list, so I can't remember the specifics, but of um, the laws that we brought in place in that period, uh, which a lot of which were due to expire on the 30th of September. So uh, the states at the last sitting um, basically have agreed to either renew or, if you like, suspend, But so, and, and some of the orders, for example, uh, are in the hands of the minister to come out if needed. So we are, you know, the armory is there. Uh, we're not going to rewrite those laws necessarily. There may be additional bits and pieces that we, we might have coming through. But uh, step one, let's increase the enforcement and increase the advice to the owners of those establishments. So you've really got to be doing this. Otherwise, yeah, we will might have to go down the uh, legislative route. Because, yeah, we're coming into the kind of Christmas party season when people yep. are kind of cramming into pubs. It's cold outside. Are we going yep. to see... COVID marshals, our version of, kind of trying to keep order. What that enforcement looks like, I can't tell you, but um, a point we're saying is that we've got to, uh, the point in the pubs and the restaurants is about a seated service. And, that, and that's been made clear before, and we're making it very, very clear again. OK, I'll let someone else have a go. OK, okay. yes. Right. Um, BBC. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Uh, can I just ask, community transmission has been low for months. Um, the case numbers have remained stable. So where is the science backing up the decision to make masks mandatory in public places? And well, when will the evidence be published that this will make a difference? I think given the technical nature, I'm definitely handing, uh, handing that to Ivan to, to give the background. Okay. Um, so... <clears throat> The, the, uh, there has been a lot of debate about the uh, efficacy of masks in uh, 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 inhibiting or reducing the spread of uh, COVID, um, and uh, the, the 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 essence is that uh, COVID uh, is spread from both symptomatic and asymptomatic individuals. Obviously, symptomatic individuals isolate, and, and that part of the COVID story is dealt with in that manner. For the asymptomatic carriers, uh, we need different measures. Uh, there are a number of those different measures, but one of them is masks. Now, uh, COVID is spread not as a sort of a virus as seen under the microscope, but it is spread within droplets and aerosols, and droplets and aerosols are relatively speaking, large. Aerosols behave like a gas, but droplets are, as the word uh, implies, a droplet. And masks uh, are, uh, do capture the droplets as they are exhaled during normal breathing, during talking, uh, and of course in greater quantities if shouting or singing loudly, for example. Um, there isn't a gold standard uh, randomized controlled trial that shows unequivocally that masks will do uh, the job, if you like. But uh, that doesn't mean to say that there aren't a huge number of observational studies that uh, point in the direction of the benefit of wearing masks to reduce the dissemination of droplets and the viruses contained within those droplets. And those observational studies include not only COVID-19, uh, 
uh, in uh, many undertaken in China, some undertaken on cruise liners, uh, some undertaken in other settings, but also other respiratory viruses. Uh, swine flu in uh, 2009 and 10, uh, flu in other seasons. SARS 2003 uh, was largely uh, a, a, an, a, a, an outbreak uh, in the Far East, and uh, the use of masks seems to have stopped that. Uh, rather well indeed, and uh, you continuing to use masks has now become, as we all know, a habit over there. It is normal for them to do so. Um, so the predominance, uh, the preponderance of these observational studies is that masks are useful uh, in protecting those around the wearer, and as well as protecting the wearer, him or herself. There is also good evidence that, uh, and, and I've got a, a sort of a list of about 48 such studies uh, here uh, in, in support of the use of masks to prevent uh, respiratory tract uh, viral infection. There is a, a, a recent uh, analysis of uh, observations in the New England Journal of Medicine from, uh, I think, June 2020. Uh, which uh, notes that the severity of illness acquired uh, if people are wearing masks is actually much less than if people were not wearing masks. And the reason for this is, is biologically plausible and is seen with other infections as well. So when people get an infection, there is a race between the germ, in this case a virus, and the immune system. And if they're both at the same starting point, then that's, uh, that gives the immune system a fair chance of keeping things under control. If, however, you have a very large inoculum of virus, then the virus has had a head start and the immune system needs to catch up, allowing the, the virus to cause a more severe illness. And, and where masks have been worn regularly, the frequency of mild or asymptomatic infection has been much greater than in areas where masks were not worn. And as I said earlier on, uh, masks are also important because they signal to us that we do indeed live in different times. And it is not just masks that will help us through this period, it is remembering all the public health guidelines. So if the masks remind us that we should keep our distance, that we should wash our hands, that we should clean touch surfaces, that is an additional protective measure. How long will cases have to be for you to say masks are no longer mandatory, and for how long? Uh, it depends on when the threat starts to abate, uh, and that depends on how much COVID there is uh, th uh, around us in Europe and the United Kingdom and elsewhere. Uh, it depends on the activity that we see uh, in Jersey, and it depends on uh, the arrival and deployment of COVID vaccine. I, I can't add too much to a wonderful scientific explanation, but just to say that it's a, it's a strange virus, isn't it? We know some people can be very severely affected by it, but other people are not affected at all. And that makes it very difficult to control. We don't know who might be carrying the virus. So therefore, the use of masks limits the spread of the virus. It's a responsibility that we can all carry out uh, as, as good citizens. We might be carrying that microbe and, and to prevent its spread from us, we can usefully use a mask and I would encourage and hope everyone would adopt that practice. Thank you. Chief Minister, can I just clarify one thing with you actually? Um, I was you about to go to your next colleague, but there we go. I, I, beg, I beg your pardon, I didn't really want to open, but I, I just want to check, because you're drafting the law now about making masks mandatory in public spaces, but um, the states will have to approve it, so when is that likely to come into force? So the law side, so the mandatory side, is, I think, scheduled for debate in uh, November. Um, we have got to obviously get the law drafted, uh, and that is why what we're saying now, it is very, very strongly advised. Um, and this is the issue between many islanders being, have been responsible in the past, they have followed the advice even when there wasn't a law behind it, but we are prepared to bring the law in as well. Uh, and obviously that will then be a matter for the Assembly, but uh, it is very, very strongly advised for all the reasons that Dr Muscat has referred to.
But anyway. Um, I understand, Chief Minister, that the number of arriving passengers coming into our port is around 70, 80 percent down on this time last year. Mm -hmm. We have very fragile air links. Has the doubling of the level at which the, the green band changes to amber, we've heard it's moving from 25 per 100,000 cases to 50, been done specifically to keep air links open? Um, were you worried that if it remained at the lower level, uh, too many travellers coming from an amber country and so having to isolate for five days would have thought it's pointless coming to Jersey? I think the best way of looking at it is all around balance of risk. Uh, and also then, um, as we've all learnt and got the systems in place that are becoming more and more sophisticated on island, um, we can... You know, we can mo we, we've modified our regime uh, on a number of occasions that we can continue to modify. So I think the fact that we're basically bringing it consistent with what the future standard will be from the European Commission is, is one of those measures. Now, the balance of risk, as we keep saying, it is all about the well-being of the island, and that's partially the health measures for COVID-19, uh, the well-being of islanders in general terms, and, and obviously the economy does come into that. Uh, I always emphasise we do not put money before people, that's very clear, but we do look at the balance of risks. Um, and so, as uh, you've stated, the number of passengers, particularly as we come out of the summer, ordinarily will, will, will fall. So therefore, um, by the, there is an increase, as, as you've referred to, but if the number of people coming in falls, then your, your risk actually, for what we're doing, uh, should stay around the same in absolute terms to the island. I think that would be... The, the summary position, just making sure. Um, but then um, also on top of that, though, is don't forget there are two measures that we're introducing. One is that everybody now will have to do a day five test. And two is that when we get to, and we're expecting it in a very short number of weeks, when we've got the average down from the on-island testing lab to around 12 hours, and, and uh, certainly... Um, and we always want to make sure these things bed in. You know, in the past we've said sometimes these things take a little while to, to stabilise, uh, but the average is falling at the moment. And I think today we're at about 22 hours. Um, when we get it down to about 12, then we're then in the capacity uh, in, the, in the place that we can then require everyone to self-isolate until they receive that, the results of that first test. So as I said, so it is about balance of a risk. It's not quite... Um, quite as bleak as you put it, because we put mitigating measures in place. Now, if you then look at the, uh, the wider um, well-being of islanders, that does fit into a couple of areas, and one of these is that it does actually allow islanders... So the, the makeup of people likely to be travelling over the next few months is less holidaymakers, more people going backwards and forwards to the island. It could be university students, it could be people visiting family, or it could be people going away to see family. Uh, and obviously there'll be business travellers as well, but, um, but within all that lot... Um, uh, by allowing that, uh, hopefully maintaining the connectivity that we've got, uh, even for a, a bit longer, hopefully throughout the winter, that allows that connectivity to keep going. And that actually is, does actually impact on things like mental health as well, because it's that connection that do make us, even though we, we live on an island, we do quite like to get off from time to time. And we do have a long, you know, winter is, is quite a long time. Um, so, but re-emphasising balance of risk, I can't give an exact date when that, that day naught test will become that we've got to self-isolate until, because it's very much based on the capacity of the lab. The lab is working, that's why the averages are coming down, and it's when we get up to full capacity and we're happy it's stable. Uh, because also as well, is, um, bear in mind that uh, when we have changed measures, we always try and leave a little bit of a time lag in, because obviously if people have booked, or actually in some instances have been travelling, uh, you, uh, you try not to catch, uh, you know, change their circumstances because that also causes disruption, which is not uh, is is best avoided if we can. Uh, I hope that gives you. Just to continue the, the the travel theme, um, Condor have been very public with the problems they're facing. Mm -hmm. um, are negotiations going on with Condor to provide them government support, possibly through the Special Situations Fund? Um, we've, as we know, we've done measures with the island, for example, and what we said is that for other lifeline matters, 
Uh, that's one of the reasons the Special Situations Fund is there. I wouldn't comment whether there were or weren't discussions going on at Condor, because obviously those would be commercially confidential until such time as if such negotiations were happening until they were concluded. But um, the Special Situations Fund is there, and it is there to assist where we can. Okay, and just very quickly, um, uh, if we continue with the uh, the, the, the 25 per 100 cases um, uh, green boundary, um, Jersey's getting close to that. Of course, um, other countries may uh, raise their boundary to 50 as well. But um, is it now the time to uh, to announce a, a comprehensive support package for the hospitality sector? Uh, that I can say is being worked on. Uh, we actually, uh, I briefly, um, we had a session with representatives from hospitality yesterday, uh, obviously mainly led by Centre Farnham, but I did attend very briefly. Uh, and certainly reiterated our support for hospitality, and we're just waiting for their feedback on that package, and then we'll work the measures through. But there is a package uh, being considered. And can you give us a time scale on that, please, Chief Minister? I can't yet. I mean, again, we're aware it's one that has got to be treated expeditiously, essentially. So it won't be a matter of months. It's got to be a matter of weeks, ideally quicker. But support is on the way for the yeah. hospitality sector? Yeah, further support is on the further, way, because please. obviously... Uh, the fund, co-funding payroll has been in there from you know from very early on, and that's I think has been welcomed across the board, but particularly within the hospitality area as well. Thank you. Okay. Um, given the narrowing down of the regional areas, mm -hmm. how quickly can you receive data from those individual local authorities, and is there a danger that a lag may actually result in? what is classified as a green zone becoming an amber zone before we make it an amber zone in effect? Uh, my short answer is I, I don't believe so. I'll um, hand over to him. I'm assuming he's more aware of it, but my understanding is that it is received uh, no less regularly than data we're receiving already. Uh, that, that is indeed the case. So it is the lower tier uh, local authorities who feed their information to the upper tier local authorities who uh, uh, then publish their data as the upper tier, and that was what we were using in the past. We are now just using the information that is uh, made available to them uh, at a more granular level. I think that just gives the indication that we've got a good system in place, and this does, you know, allow us to generate the sector of flexibility, which is responding to the data as the data evolves, as it gets better. We can do different things. Um, the other thing I did just want to ask about masks as well. You've talked about masks in indoor public places, but not workplaces. How do you marry those two thoughts of pros, those two schools of thought up? Um, obviously, it seems a little bit odd that someone can go out for lunch in a cafe, be asked to wear a mask, and immediately get back to their desk at the office and take that mask off. Why, is, why have you talked about indoor public places in that way and not included workplaces? Well, principally because there are other measures that workplaces have to put in place. Mm. Um, physical distancing being perhaps the primary one. Um, so people must be separated if, if they're at desks. Um, ventilation and other, all, all sorts of measures. Because a workplace is often a, a more controlled space. Whereas a public space, uh, if we're in a supermarket, uh, we can't avoid brushing against somebody or, or people passing near to us. Um, we must remember supermarkets are also workplaces, uh, so the staff there uh, need to be protected as, as far as possible, uh, and everyone who is um, uh, uh, working in, in an area where the public are receiving services. Uh, so it will protect those staff members also. Thank you. Um, do you want to add anything? Um, and I, I completely agree, of course, with uh, the, the health minister. Those are the, some of the main uh, reasons for this. And an additional one is um, that in the workplace, there is a sort of bubble concept, uh, so that if an individual within a workplace is positive, then it is uh, usually fairly straightforward to establish who the direct contacts are. In contradistinction to... Uh, a, a, a public, a very public uh, indoor space where uh, establishing who your direct contacts are may be a bit more difficult. Of course the app will help cater for the latter but that will simply complement 
the, the uh, other measures that we are putting in place preemptively to avoid us going into uh, significant COVID activity. Okay, it is 22. Uh, I'm happy to do one very quick one question each. <laughs> That's not one in the supplementary. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, when you talk about community testing and increasing rates there, uh, does that mean kind of randomised household testing, or is it still just going to be targeted at particular workplaces? Both. Um, so uh, certainly, I can confirm that uh, we 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 have uh, a plan for uh, screening essential workers at uh, rates that uh, reflect uh, the, the degree of risk to them and to others. Um, but we are also thinking about uh, undertaking uh, general community-based PCR uh, prevalence testing um, to determine what the degree of activity is uh, in the general population. Um, we are also looking at the uh, on the same vein, uh, we are also looking at the possibility of uh, looking at the concentration of uh, uh, coronavirus PCR uh, in in uh, in sewage, because the virus is also excreted in, in by the gut, and not just the respiratory tract, uh, to give us an idea of what the population-wide uh, uh, burden of co COVID viruses, and if that burden appears to be going up, then we will need to consider further measures. Um, that is just very much uh, at inception. Uh, we have not uh, tried it out uh, in reality yet, but it is some. We've got done all the groundwork. And we are about to start doing that in the next few days, hopefully, uh, at, if not in the next week or two. And just, just briefly, are other countries doing that? Are there places where this is working? Other countries are doing that. We're doing that with them. We are learning with them. This is a new way of surveying for COVID for everyone. So uh, we, are, we are in that mix with them. Uh, them being largely universities in the UK, uh, although we are also in liaison with the universities in the Netherlands. And, and the, the, the whole idea is to um, put all the information we have together to give us an idea of, of where things are going and how to best interpret things. Thank you. Chief Minister, when are you expecting the Jersey-based lab to reach 2,000 tests per day? And is it likely then that that will put the number of positive tests received up? Uh, I'll hand over to Alan slightly, but my expectation, if... Um, OK, I'm expecting it to, uh, towards the end of two weeks. OK, I'd want to give a... Uh, it's always dependent on uh, un unknown unknowns, if that makes sense. And um, don't forget, we've got the off-island capacity, you know, uh, to date. But the point is that uh, the idea is that the capacity builds up, and then when it's stabilised, and so it depends if they think actually we need a couple more days just to make sure. But broadly speaking, the target is is in approximately two-ish weeks, actually two to three, should we say? Uh, on the latter point. Um, uh, the point is, is that the um, number, t just because of where, of where the test is being taken, where, apply, um, where the test is being processed, i.e. on island or off island, shouldn't increase the number of positive tests. It just increases this turnaround time, and therefore if we do find a positive test, it, again, we can react quicker, and that's all about keeping islanders safe. Better work. Thank you, Chief Minister. I've actually got a very practical question from a reader who's contacted us. Would the, uh, would the government support um, pop-up shops or some form of shop at the port, particularly with the half term in a few, year, a few weeks, um, in order for people to be able to buy essentials um, when they come back um, and not having to go into a, a shop so they can go uh, self-isolate straight away? I have to say that's not one I've um, uh, thought through, but I'll, we'll take that on board and... Uh, 
feed it back actually and see if it's practical. Okay. Um, but uh, it's, an in it's an interesting point. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, as we enter the winter months, how, uh, as, if should any clusters form, have you given any thought to sort of localised lockdowns in certain areas of the island or certain buildings, that kind of thing? What What's the chances of that happening? I think the short answer is yes, but I think that's where I'm going to give some of the detail. It very much depends on the circumstances. I, I completely, thank you, I completely agree with the Chief Minister. It depends on the circumstances, so the idea is to... Uh, manage the uh, infection uh, as effectively as possible uh, with, but by causing the least disruption. Uh, so it would be a, a sort of a fine balance between the two. If it is necessary to uh, um, uh, isolate uh, or quarantine uh, a, a, a large number of people working uh, in, in, in a particular site, uh, then that's what we will do. But if we can actually um, manage things safely by uh, quarantining or isolating a smaller number of people, and te uh, then, then of course that would be the pathway that we would follow. Uh, and we are um, uh, going through uh, sort of different scenarios as tabletop exercises, if you like, um, uh, on, a, on an ongoing basis to prepare ourselves for uh, different eventualities. Okay. Well, we can just start drawing things to a close, but just before we end on the press conference, I'd just like to extend, obviously, my thanks to uh, Dr. Uh, Muscat, Dr. Turnbull, and all of our medical professionals, and to the officers working across government departments, to parish officials, to ministers, states members, and to all of you, all islanders, for our, your collective efforts. We're in a much more fortunate position than most jurisdictions, not only because of our geography, but because of our economic resources, our PPE stocks, and our testing capacity. But most of all, thanks to the cooperation of islanders who continue to prove their resilience and determination to reduce the transmission of COVID-19 and to keep Jersey safe. Thank you for listening, and I look forward to speaking to you uh, next time around.